Hello friends and welcome to episode 3 of the Timist podcast series. My name is James and I am the Timist and the host of the thing you're currently listening to. In this episode, I officially introduce my co-host, Connor, who many of you already know as a previous guest. He's funny, he's knowledgeable, and he's an AD of many luxury brands. It only made sense for us to continue on this path. And that's not to say that I won't have new guests, as previously promised, like watchmakers, collectors, and the like, but it does mean that he is now a mainstay. As for this episode, we'll be talking about the biggest watch event of the year, Watches and Wonders 2024. We'll go over some of the things we'd like to say goodbye to, like rainbow bezels, new things we'd like to see get announced, rumors, and of course, some harsh realities that come with the new releases. Lastly, we close things out with our first ever Q&A session. I put out the call on Instagram, and you awesome people answered sending me your AD-specific questions. And you didn't hold back. All this and more, so sit back, relax, grab a drink and a snack as we get started. Connor, welcome to the Time is Podcast Series episode number three. It's a big one. It's our first official host co-host episode, yes? Wow, I've got promoted or demoted. No, no. Either way, it's, I'm happy to be here. It's a promotion. It's a promotion. <laughs> uh, I think it's good. Welcome. Think, I'm so happy. Yeah, no, super cool to be here. I do think terms like promotion implies there's some sort of financial thing going on, so I'll yeah. have to reread the contract that doesn't exist, but that's yeah. promising all the same. A fresh draft was uh, printed out this morning. I think it comes with the added perk of now you get something to drink if you like. Ooh. Yes. That's way better than most unpaid internships. <laughs> so big day, big episode. In fact, we don't want to waste any time. So we're going to skip over the news segment, over the spotlight and over the behind the curtain and focus on something massive that's coming up very, very soon, specifically Watches and Wonders 2024. Here yeah. we are with our first episode with a purpose with a purpose with a guiding light our northern star watches and wonders and then maybe at the end i was thinking we wrap up with some q a's some people sent me some questions oh you did you get some cool questions i got some cool questions all right that directed. sounds nerve-wracking my hand just started sweating but let's do it that yeah. sounds fun he has yeah. no idea what those questions are <laughs> people sent them in i've saved them and i will shout them out Hooray. okay shall we get started Let's get started. Okay. Probably before we dive in, we should preface and explain to our listeners what Watches and Wonders actually is. Mm, yeah. So for folks that don't know, Watches and Wonders is a yearly watch gathering of a bunch of brands from all over the world. It's a sort of like CES for the watch industry, or if you're old enough, and if you remember, and you happen to be a gamer, uh, E3. Mm. Yeah. Is that is that pretty good? Pretty it's good. like E3 with less cringy presentations. More, yeah. More, more suits as well. More suits. Less hoodies, more suits. Yeah. I do like a good hoodie. Hmm. Gamer at heart. But you know what that life is all about. It's true. But maybe we segment it a little bit and uh, start with what do we want to say goodbye to in 2024 at Watches and Wonders? Like basically, what are we tired of? And it's been played out and we've seen it time and time again. And now, you know what? Maybe it's time it go out to pasture and we just never see it for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Absolutely. I mean, Watches and Wonders is often thought of as a place to debut new product, but really what it is, I mean, it is that, but in addition to that, it's really where the watch industry is showing where it's trending, what they're going to focus on, what they believe is important. Yes, new product, but also new advertising campaigns, new uh, celebrity endorsements, and really kind of you can see through the products and through the unveilings what these brands are going to be working on and how they're going to be shaping the brands themselves in the next you know few years kind of thing. Yeah, it's I mean, sort of the state of the union, as it were, for watches is how I think about it in a lot of ways. Right, right, right. I mean, it's important to keep in mind, uh, most people don't realize this, but building a product portfolio requires years of advanced planning and execution in order to deliver something that, you know, the, the people want, hopefully. So what we're seeing or what we will see during Watches and Wonders 2024 will have been baking in the oven for a little while now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So with that said, maybe we focus on the goodbyes. Anything you want to say goodbye to in 2024 that you don't want to see make an appearance at, 20, at uh, Watches and Wonders? Yeah, I, there's definitely something that I would be very eager to see less of, which is rainbow sapphire bezels. Oh, my. So obviously we've seen it from variety of brands now. The most 
uh, infamous and celebrated version is the Daytona. Right. With what's often referred to as the rainbow bezel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Rolex is amazing with their gem set. And, and so are other brands, too. Obviously, it's not just getting a whole bunch of sapphires. It's finding that perfect gradation of the different colors and then finding it again and again and again for however many watches you're making. It's amazing. It's very cool. I don't think I need to see every brand doing it. Mm. It was interesting when that Daytona came out and every release, um, regardless of how you feel about the brand who released it, to me, it's less and less interesting. I think if you are unveiling a rainbow sapphire bezel in 2024 and 2025, it feels to me like you saw what someone else was doing, whether it was Hublot, whether it was Rolex, whether it was Richard Mill, whoever. And then you said, hey, can we do that? Oh, we can? Cool, gather a bunch of sapphires and we'll put that on X model. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. It's a cool look. It might even be more interesting and engaging than just a bunch of diamonds. I'm just, I don't, I don't need to see that anymore. I'm ready to say goodbye to the rainbow sapphire bezel. I think it's very cool. And what else you got? Interesting, interesting take. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, last year in 2023, I think Omega had a couple special versions, I think of the Speedmaster. No, I think it might have been the Seamaster. I'm not quite sure. Don't quote me on this right now. But they had like a gradation. It wasn't a full rainbow. They, they did a special Bond. Bond, that's what it was. It was an anniversary Bond watch. Mm -hmm. And I believe the colors related to... I want to say the Jamaican flag. Right. That was a super it was, unexpected. Yeah, it was Ian Fleming's vacation home or his, he had a home in Jamaica. Naturally. And I believe the home is, it has some Bond reference, like it's called Skyfall or <laughs> Spectre or something. I, I can't remember, but yeah, there's a connection there. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess there's more than just rainbow. There's multicolored sapphire yeah. bezels. You can yeah. do a lot with sapphires. They come in every color in the rainbow, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. But all of it, all of it could just go. I just feel like at this point, you're just doing what someone else did possibly better or at least earlier than you. Mm -hmm. And considering you can do anything with stones, with yeah. anything with bezels. I mean, that Omega we're talking about, at least it wasn't a rainbow. That's at least true. It had its own imagery and its own reason for having those colors. And I mean, if you like it, you like it. But yeah, but I just the, don't need to see more. The allure, the magic, the shock value is not there anymore. It's like that first time you've eaten that incredible meal at that restaurant that you found and it blew your mind. You're like, this is incredible. This is the most amazing dish I've ever had. So then you look forward to eating it again, but it's never, you can never hit that apex, that peak of like excitement anymore because you've already experienced it. So mm -hmm. where do you go next? We're all chasing that cheese pizza we had when we were eight. That's true. Mm, bagel bites. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, I'm going to... Yeah, what's we'll top of yours? I want to say goodbye and I want to see less of gender segmentation as far as like, this is a men's watch. This is a woman's watch. Oh. Because too often we see they'll take a modern uh, piece from their catalog that is, uh, you know, considered traditionally to be a men's piece and they'll shrink it and then they'll pink it and then they'll put some stones on it and they'll go, this one's for the ladies. Mm -hmm. Oh, it also has a quartz movement now because <laughs> because the ladies don't care about uh automatic movements yeah. and they don't want to you know go through the hassle of setting the watch it's just set it and forget it there it is this is what you want right and i don't speak on behalf of the other half of the planet but i'm just going like maybe you just make cool watches and stop like saying this is a men's watch and this is a woman's watch because I don't want to feel weird if I see a cool watch and I end up finding out that it's a woman's piece. And I'm like, well, I really like it and it fits me really well. I want to wear it or vice versa. Or maybe my wife will see a cool piece and she goes, well, that's really cool. And I was like, well, that's traditionally a men's watch. Totally. And and I think uh, while the watch brands are good at a lot of stuff, they're not exactly finger on the pulse for that kind of thing. Mm. Um, women definitely wear stereotypical men's watches extremely frequently all the time. If you want to break it down like that, there's way more men's watches. So, of course, they're going to. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, there was a lot of watches like that 36 millimeter pink dial Carrera that tag release this year, mm -hmm. the one that uh, Gosling, the actor, not the baby geese, uh, <laughs> he wore to the Barbie premiere. Right. Really, really popular. Yep. Really huge. I mean, obviously, they gave it to him to wear, but I'm sure conceptually at some point they said, this is a 36 millimeter, full stop, extremely pink watch. Yeah. This is for the ladies, but we sold that to men, 
men requested it. So I think how they think of a watch and who's actually buying it, very different. Oh, maybe we could take a quick detour. So like your day job, you're, you're an authorized dealer of many luxury brands, right? Yeah. So I'm curious, just a little segue here, detour if we can. Have you seen an uptick in men coming in asking or searching for watches that would traditionally be labeled for women? Yeah, I mean, generally the biggest barrier is not design or style. It's usually size. If a man is used to wearing, you know, somewhere around a 40 millimeter watch, uh, a watch that might be designed or thought of as a woman's watch might be 36 or under, and that's the challenging part. I definitely see a lot more couples kind of going it down the the same watch route, whether mm -hmm. it's a uh, Black Bay 58s and Black Bay 54s, both of which I would assume are maybe considered men's watches. But, you know, a couple wearing those watches, you know, man with maybe the 39, woman with the 37. Uh, Cartier is an amazing brand for that because they tend to make uh, larger and smaller sizes of most of their entire collection. Mm -hmm. Longines is in the same way. So yeah, I think I'm seeing a huge trend in smaller dial watches on men. Okay. Under 39 millimeter, more popular than it's been in a very long time. I think generally a lot of the watches designed for women are very much so designed for women in that they're extremely thin and light and they tend to be quartz movements. They tend to be set with precious stones. That turns off a lot of guys, but otherwise they're very much into what they're seeing. It's just, they're kind of like, eh, I don't know if this is for me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's good insight to have him. Thanks for sharing. Uh, maybe we go on to the next thing and say what we'd like to see during this 2024 Watches and Wonder season. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Are you ready? I, I have a small note with some small notes on it. So oh, that do? makes me feel moderately ready. We'll see about that. Yeah. We'll see. Well, won't you start, Mr. I got notes? <laughs> Um, okay, so I kind of wrote this like what I expect to see more of. Okay. I don't know if I'm necessarily like want to see more of it. I'm not against any of it. Uh, one of them I would expect to see the trend continuing across all brands. Mm -hmm. And by that, I really mean across all price ranges because brands tend to be in different price categories, in-house movements. You want to see more in-house movements? I expect to see more uh, in-house movements. expect, okay. okay. Um, I think the modern watch consumer is extremely used to that term, mm -hmm. whether they're fully abreast of what it means. And it's another term like Swiss made where it has a very specific meaning and brands find ways of playing with that meaning and, mm -hmm. and, and making their own. Oh, it's an in-house movement because we took an ETA movement and we made it our own by putting a different rotor on different it. rotor yeah i mean you know there's all kinds of ways they can do that i just think that the modern watch consumer consuming a little bit of media you know a couple youtube channels a couple of this and that maybe a great podcast <laughs> what they find is that they've been told in-house movements are what you should be buying right whether you're spending a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars or you know, $10,000, whatever it is, they expect to see an in-house movement. And so I expect more brands, even brands you necessarily wouldn't expect or even want an in-house movement from, like we've seen um, Louis Vuitton making in-house movements. And what in-house movements they are indeed. They're amazing, right? Um, and maybe that makes sense because it matches the price tag. Those are very expensive watches, just making them out of precious metals or just having, you know, Fume enamel dials is is no longer enough. People want to see a, a really great in-house movement for that. I expect to see that from basically everyone. I would love to see a tambour in the real. They look wild and wacky in the best way possible, I think. They're not for everyone, but I, I, uh, I'm i picking up what you're putting down. Mm -hmm. Okay, my turn. I think we're going to see a influx in more white dials. And I'm not just saying that because Omega just released the white dial uh, moon watch. Mm -hmm. I just think that white dials are coming back and they're coming back in a big way. Um, it's spring, summer. It's a nice color to wear. It's fresh. It's clean. It's sharp. It pairs with almost anything. And I think truly we'll see an influx because popular thing. it's a popular thing. I would say, and this is maybe a technicality and maybe a whatever, I would expect to see more like mm, off white, oh, light, light silver. Yeah, point. like there's a there is kind of um you have the an enamel GMT. or a parchment white that mm -hmm. you do see sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
they tend to reserve white white for the hands and you see often more of an opaline like with the Tudor GMT mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or with the Mark 20 from IWC. Mm -hmm. It's white, but that's not white. It's white. it's got a little bit yeah. of silver. It's not like silver like chrome or like steel, but has a little bit of reflection to it. You can see a little bit of gradation, a little bit of sunburst, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm down for that. I love that look. I love it as well. And that's why I said it because I'm hoping to manifest it because I like white dial watches. There you go. Uh, you got anything else on the list that you'd like to see? Yeah, I I, I would uh, expect to see again from kind of all brands mm -hmm. uh, more GMTs. Okay. I think the GMT for whatever reason has become kind of the complication. I think for a very long time it was chronographs. Chronographs are obviously still very popular. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of brands don't have a heavy focus on GMTs, especially brands in the, I don't know, say under $3,000 price range. Mm -hmm. Just in general, I think the, the popularity of the GMT Master 2 from Rolex and uh, the Longines Zulu time and other watches in general. Not, not, not because in episode one, I said that my favorite complication is GMT, right? Not because of that. That's not why they're coming out with it. That's not why you're expecting that. I mean, I don't have evidence to say otherwise. And until otherwise discovered such evidence, uh, we can assume that maybe possibly potentially. So yeah, then I expect to see more GMTs because allegedly you made them popular two weeks ago. I didn't say it, but uh, you heard here, ladies and gentlemen. Allegedly. Allegedly. Okay, more GMTs. I dig more it. GMTs. Mm -hmm. So I want to see more, and this is selfish of me, and you know this very well about me, I love titanium. Mm. So I'm going to say I expect more titanium to be used in the watchmaking world. In fact, we've seen a massive influx in titanium 2022, 2023. I would argue that 2023 was the year of titanium. The titanium mines are open. That's true. That's true. And they're they're chugging away furiously at um, all the tooling that all these manufacturers have had to invest money in to be able to create and work with this material, because obviously they can't use the same tools that they normally work with for stainless steel. But yes, that is obvious to me who also knew that. Yeah, exactly. Material science. We're just on the same wavelength. Yep, we yep. just were there. I want to see more titanium and I expect to see more titanium. In fact, I will be so bold as to say, I believe Two years ago, we got the 50 mil beast from Rolex in titanium. Don't scoff. You and Flavia right now. RLX titanium. RLX titanium. That was two years ago. A year ago, as in last 2023 Watches and Wonders, we had the Yachtmaster 42 from Rolex in titanium, RLX. And then this year, I am going to say we will see a new watch from the Rolex product portfolio be introduced in titanium. Interesting. So then I had a question, which was, when you say more titanium, mm -hmm. are you kind of implying that brands will take pre-existing models and re-release them in titanium as opposed to steel? We just, we saw Longines do that in the Zulu time as a Houdinki collaboration. They, they put it out. I think so, but I, I don't think they'll remove the stainless steel option. Sure, 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 sure. Right. But but introducing, introducing same watch, to, yep. new material. Yep. Yeah, yep, I love yep. that. My dream, I'll tell you right now, if if Breitling comes out with a 43 mil brushed titanium Navitimer, I'm going to lose it, Connor. I'm going to lose it. Okay. And I want it to be on a rubber strap. I want you to take your most iconic uh, signature piece that says Breitling and turn it into a rugged, heavy duty, very capable, not that you would put it through hell and back, but you could if you want it to, which heavy is which duty, more like light duty. Light duty, titanium, 40% lighter than stainless steel. Let's go. Uh, yeah, I would lose it. So that's that's what I would like to see more of. And I expect to see more of in 2023. At Watches and Wonders, more titanium. Your turn, go. Yeah, well, real quick on the titanium okay, thing. Yeah. I put watches on a lot of people's wrists mm -hmm. as part of my job. Yeah. Titanium is very divisive. Yeah, I know. I know it Some is. Some people... In, and it's an instant reaction. It's not a, a two minutes. It's an instant reaction. It's usually oh. oftentimes they're like, is this a real watch? Mm -hmm. Like, does this have the movement in it? If they have never worn a titanium watch or they've just tried on, say, like three or four steel watches and then suddenly you give them a titanium watch. And, and some people are like, oh, my gosh, I love it. It doesn't feel like I'm even wearing anything. I could sleep with this on. And I'd never know it. What a cool feature. And other people go, it's too light. And, and I like the heft of a watch. So when you were saying your your dream Navitimer over there, in my head, I'm like, would the Bright Boys like that? That's what you call yourselves, right, Bright Boys? I don't call myself that. Yeah, you, the Is tattoo that, on your arm says it. What are you talking about? But, you know, like if, <laughs> if, if you're into like large 
steel yeah. tools as yeah. these things are very regarded brightling i gives me very like machismo kind of vibes mm -hmm. you know even with their design with like the brickwork and their boutiques mm -hmm. and all that would they produce a piece that is this rugged beast as you're describing but then weighs like a calatrava well i mean they have the avenger right they have the avenger night mission which i really really like it comes in this like black titanium dlc coated uh case so it looks the part, it looks like something you would see on a Delta Force, you know, Ranger or, you know, highly trained professional that's super capable, um, very resistant to whatever you can throw at it. And it looks the part and it feels high tech, modern and capable. It, it feels like someone was like, yeah, well, we make the SR-71 Blackbird out of this stuff. It's the fastest thing ever. It has no weapons. It's its weapon is speed and um, pictures and pictures. Yeah, it takes really, really high dynamic pictures. But, you know, it's it's this high tech material that, yeah, you either vibe with it and you get it or you go this doesn't feel like a real watch why am i paying you so much money for this mm -hmm. thing yeah. um it feels like a toy so if you can't get over that hill of it's light because it's high tech this material is stronger than stainless steel and if you don't care for any of that material science stuff then yeah you can immediately sort of like write it off and i get it i get it but as a kid i was obsessed with the material because airplanes and really cool things that went really, really fast were made out of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, cool. You can make a watch out of it. I want it to be made out of that cool stuff. True. I know you got all crazy when that new iPhone came out. Actually, yeah, a little bit. Oh, really? I was, I was joking. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, I actually, I gathered footage from the Museum of Flight and I'm, I'm working on a video that will come out eventually on my YouTube channel, but it is dedicated to titanium as a material. It'll be similar to the Omega Silver Snoopy video that I've put together that will go live before this podcast goes out. It's live right now. It is technically live right now. In the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is live right now, says future us to past us. I mean, welcome to my world. I've been I've been preaching this material for the past 20 years, you know, since I was a teenager. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Why wouldn't you want to watch out of titanium? That's just me and my personal bias. Mm -hmm. All right. Get off your titanium soapbox. All right. One second. There, I'm off. Okay, your turn. I expect to see and not necessarily unveiled at Watch the Wonders, but in regards to where the watch industry is trending, I expect to see more collaborations. Oh, like uh, like the Hodinkee? Like the Hodinkee ones, mm -hmm. like the John Mayer ones. So I, I think there'll be ones that are specific to people. I think there's more that'll be specific to brands. Obviously, Swatch Group doesn't take place in Watches and Wonders, but they've obviously had huge success collaborating within the Swatch Group, Omega and Swatch, uh, Swatch and uh, Blancpain. Let me just pause you right there. Yeah, no, you can't say it and not expect me to interrupt you. It's actually pronounced blanc pan. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Yep, continue, sorry. Thank you. I think more than anything else, or at least in addition to it, collaborations create buzz. Yeah. Because they can create buzz outside of the watch sector. Right. Right. Um, a John Mayer and Ed Sheeran collaboration is obviously going to resonate with their fans mm -hmm. uh, who might not give a crap about watches prior to that, as well as just kind of the music industry writ large. Same with like uh, fashion brands or I mean, the list goes on and on and on. We see it with uh, Tag Heuer has Porsche ones. I mean, there's 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 already baked into the industry quite a few collaborations that go on and on and on, but I expect to see more like we've been seeing with AP, with kind of celebrities, influencers, and their brands, because it's it's really good baked in advertising and you can potentially, you know, double or triple the clout that your watch is going to produce and you yeah. can associate your brand with these cool relevant celebrities and say hey we're working with these people like oh you like that ed sheeran is a watch collector you think that's cool in addition to being this musician well he has a g-shock yeah and yeah. you can own that g-shock i think that's I, I think there's a lot of there's just a lot of business in it so i expect to see it more and more we saw it more with sneakers we saw it more with with other items as well fashion labels so I would expect to see more of that in the coming years. And I wouldn't be surprised to see something unveiled at Watches and Wonders from at least one or two or three brands. I mean, and, and there's out there stuff. Remember last year they unveiled a, a Hublot Nespresso collaboration? 
Uh, no, I don't remember that. Okay, really? Yeah. Yeah, the Hublot uh, collaborated with Nespresso, and they, like, you know, the George coffee Clooney pods. George Clooney Nespresso? Uh, sure. You know, the coffee pods and uh -huh, all that. Uh, -huh. uh And they, they used recycled parts from Nespresso pods in the creation of the watch. Wow. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was so much like, hey, Nespresso fans, we've yeah. got a Hublot for you. More of, look what we can do. Yeah, but either way, it's a collaboration. Yeah. And either yeah. way, we're talking about it. That's. But if it was just a, like a green ceramic Hublot, I, I don't know if it would be like, oh, that's cool. Like, I'm sure someone's into that. But because it's an interesting collaboration, at least it's like, hey, man, what is this? Yeah, yeah. You know? it's, it's, it's the amplification and the leverage of two or more brands that have their own collective uh, fan base and like the cross pollination of those things sort of overlapping in this weird Venn diagram of like, you probably don't know that this thing exists, but maybe you do, but you most definitely know that this thing exists because you're a fan of it. Well, this thing that you're a fan of has worked with this other group of people that also make this thing pretty cool, right? Maybe. Well, now you know about it. Mario Kart Tech Hoyer. Mario Kart Tag Heuer. You know, at the, the the collaborations don't have to be the most obvious ones. I feel like the G-Shock ones lately, those are pretty predictable because the people they've been collaborating with, the Ben Climbers, the Ed Sheerans, right. they're kind of first name basis. Those are A-list watch celebrities. I don't know if they're... And they run in the same... Those guys are A-list celebrities. Probably Ed Sheeran is, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. They have watch Riz. They are going to get featured, but yeah. Yeah. any kind of collaboration is media worthy and gonna bring some eyeballs and some earballs onto your <laughs> yeah i'm sorry you just said earballs and i'm like what is that okay good more collaborations i can see that you got something else on the list um yeah i would love to see more smaller size mm-hmm talking 37 millimeters and below what mm -hmm. might be normally targeted as a woman's watch i know we're trying to get away from that but that's what i'm talking about steel sports non-precious ap already did their reveal of new watches mm -hmm. and they put out a 30 mil 37 millimeter royal oak all stainless steel no diamonds and obviously they're they're putting it out for a female audience but obviously anybody could buy it and wear it but they've only produced this watch in the past with a diamond bezel i did see that yeah this is just a steel watch mm-hmm and that's cool because A, it's literally what people are asking for, mm -hmm. and B, it, it shows that they are also noticing an evolving watch demographic where it's not like, oh, this women wear jewelry mm -hmm. made of diamonds more than men do, so when they buy a watch, it should have diamonds in it. It's like, no, they should have the option to put diamonds in it, mm -hmm. but they should also have the option to have a regular steel watch that isn't, you know, four times as expensive because you flooded it with very, very expensive gemstones. It's true. I mean, I think you and I, we had this conversation while you were at work. I paid you a little visit and we were looking at some lovely, lovely Cartier watches. And one of them had, I think it was just a diamond set bezel. And I was like, Ooh, that is so pretty. I think it was, I think it was a tank. And it was you, a tank American. It was the tank American. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that is stunning. I asked you how much it was and you said how much it was. And I don't remember how much it was because my brain just immediately purged that information because it was a lot more. Mm -hmm. It was still a stainless steel yeah. with diamonds though. They, they so, frequently like double the price. Which is a big, a big, that's a big number. Whatever I was prepared to pay, if you say it's now twice as much, mm -hmm. that uh, that tends to raise my blood pressure pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you want to add or is it my turn? I think that's it for me. Okay. Well, I'm going to say I want to see more affordable complications in the spirit, if you will, of uh, the Christopher Ward bel canto. Do you know why Christopher Ward watches cost so much less than I, other watches you've seen in stores? I feel like you were waiting for me to say that, uh, but I'm going to try to steal your thunder and I'm going to try to guess why. It's because they don't sell their watches in physical locations. It's because they don't sell their watches in physical locations. I got it. All right. And also they don't train people. Right. They don't right. train authorized dealers. They don't have to ship product. They don't have to price things knowing that someone else has to sell it. Right. They they sell their product off their website and maybe somewhere else. But I think just their website. So they're the only ones shipping and selling their product. If I sell their product, I have to buy their product and then 
sell it new because I'm in this fictional scenario an authorized dealer for Christopher Ward. I have to be able to sell it where we both make money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So either Christopher Ward keeps the same price and now I have to sell it for double that. So now it's as expensive as its competitors or that's not an option. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's fair. That's fair. I guess you can save some money on that front, but still, I just think that there's an opportunity there. And I, I, I feel like this is more of what I'm hoping to see in 2024 Watches and Wonders. And that is that there's a, a green space there that hasn't been cultivated that needs to have more of this sort of watch manufacturing and creative thinking where they go, I could do that. Sort of like the Bel Canto, right? The striking hour functionality, which is very, very cool. I mean, you can have something like that for under $3,500, which is kind of ridiculous. You know, relatively speaking, when you look at the world of like watches that make noises that are mechanically powered, <laughs> right? More of, more of that, because I think we've seen the ridiculous, the outrageous, the, the rainbow bezels, the crazy, you know, meteorite dials or, or mother of pearl or, you know, things. Like master complications. Yeah, exactly. Like things that are sort of uh, in the realm of fantasy for the majority of us. But having something that is sort of like a taste, a morsel, an amuse-bouche, <laughs> an appetizer, if you will, of that high-end hot horology world, it dings like the old clocks of yore. And it's fascinating and really cool because it's doing it mechanically. It's all mechanically driven. That, I don't know, excitement and that allure, I feel like is missing. And, and we only see it every now and then periodically pop up within the watch world. And I want to see more of that, hopefully, during Watches and Wonders. I don't think you're going to see it. Yeah, I think you're right. It's just they can keep those watches at an affordable level because they're controlling their own market and they're not having other people sell their product and they're not having to rent spaces and train staff. That's ungodly amounts of money. But I mean, if if Christopher Ward can do it, surely someone else can as well. Well, for sure. And, and, and we're seeing more of that because more people are buying watches online even watches they can buy uh, in store, you know, whether it's, you know, a Chrono 24 or just whatever, HamiltonWatches.com kind of thing. More people are buying watches sight unseen, which, and I'm biased, like wearing that on my chest here, but I don't recommend that because you can watch every video, you can study every step. Yeah. You have to see and feel it. Like when you when you're talking about uh, impressive complications, these hotelology complications at affordable price, the first thing I think of is where are they going to save the money? Because it has to be somewhere. If it's not in the movement, then it's that bracelet. You're going to get this terrible bracelet, right? Or it's on the you know something, the warranty, the service, the QC. It has to give somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you're talking about like you know. $3,000 off what you'd expect it to be. Uh, where's that coming from? Right. You it, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and usually the big sacrifice is you just have to go with it. Everyone I know who purchased a Bel Canto did it sight unseen. Saw images online. It's not like they just went like, ah, it sounds good. But yeah, yeah. that's a, it's a big risk. It's a huge risk. It is. Luckily, I know that Christopher Ward has a very good like return policy and they ship things out and they have like the logistics and infrastructure in place to sort of mitigate and help you make that jump and say, I will buy something that is $3,500 to $4,000 worth of my monies sight unseen. Yeah, it is definitely a lot of overhead and investment on that company's behalf in order to, you know, build confidence. And I got to ask yeah. because I really don't know. Yeah. And I, I, you know, this is just kind of how my brain works about this kind of thing. If I own a Christopher Ward, I, I buy a Bel Canto and I enjoy it and let's fast forward five or six or seven or whatever years and I need to get it serviced. You send it to them? Here's the process of how you go about doing it. Oh that. yeah, I'm sure they have a system set up. But I just mean like, yeah, you know, also I couldn't imagine servicing a chime is inexpensive, but I have no idea. I, I don't want to sound like I'm down on Christopher Ward. I think it's really cool. I just feel like people are like, how do they make it so cheap? It's like, because you can't see it. So <laughs> You can't touch it. That's true. It's just online. So actually, Andrew Morgan on his Andrew Morgan Watches uh, channel published a video, well, I would say in the last couple of weeks, um, showcasing his one of one uh, bel canto that he got made. And he dives pretty deep into explaining, you know, where the cost savings are, are happening. Um, and most of it, yeah, you can't see. It's it's movement isn't necessarily finished. Things that you'll never notice will not have been polished to a degree that you can appreciate. 
and your watchmaker will be able to see that or whoever it is that you send it in. They'll be like, oh yeah, this doesn't look very fit and finished, but what you can see is finished to a decent level. And so um, I do recommend folks to watch that Andrew Morgan video if they get a chance and if they're curious about the bell canto, but this isn't a bell canto podcast. So I think I've said enough. I still want to see interesting complications at reasonably affordable prices come out. Classic consumer wants more for less. Uh, Unbelievable. That's me. (laughs) So that's basically everything that I can come up with that I'd like to see at this point in time for the 2024 Watches and Wonders. Did you have anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I do. I... Watch the Wonders is a really exciting time of year, Absolutely. right? It's the biggest feast day in the entire watch calendar. Watch media goes crazy. If anything, there's more watch news produced over those whatever four or five days or even less, mm-hmm. three or four days, than the rest of the 360 days in the year. Usually the amount of unveilings and uh, news dropped can't even be covered. I think I saw there's 54 different brands this year attending Watches and Wonders. Every single one of those brands will have multiple products, multiple announcements, new materials, new colors, new dials, all kinds of new stuff. And usually, you know, teasers about what's coming up later in the year Mm -hmm. or next year Mm -hmm. or, you know, interesting celebrities who are making appearances. And there's so much to cover that we often don't even get to cover every single thing or even aware of every single thing. So it's a very exciting time. And the watch media feasts. And watch fans feast as well. It's it's an overload. It's it's an overload of the the, the coolest things that we are big fans of, obviously. Right. And it doesn't even feature all the brands. The famously the Swatch group is not uh, a part of it at all. But I will say, as exciting as it is, as cool as it is, as interesting as it is, I sort of dread it. I don't personally look forward to it. I think you have a unique perspective that most of us lack given that you are an A D. And so That in and of itself brings with it certain things, right? Certain things. Uh, Some of those certain things are the products themselves. You're going to hit us with some reality. (laughs) So uh, it's worth saying no matter what the product is, no matter what brand it's from, no matter what price range it's from, the first year of its existence, it'll be usually the most popular and definitely in the least supply right? They've had the least amount of time to physically produce these things. Oftentimes the production isn't totally aligned with the announcement. Oftentimes the announcements don't cover the fine night and very important details such as a great example would be the IWC Ingenieur that was debuted last year at Watches and Wonders. Everybody lost their mind. Everybody lost their mind. I mean, it's all the things, right? It's Genta designed. It's integrated bracelet. It's a real in-house movement, the 32111 made by IWC in-house. Really, really cool. One of the details that was left out, very important, was that his boutique only Mm. is only available at IWC boutiques, of which there is not that many. We live in the Pacific Northwest, there is none. So while we do live in a major metropolitan area with a lot of boutiques and a lot of people and a lot of money, that watch is not available to us. It's not even visible to us. Now, they had a good reason for doing that, which was that it wasn't really available in big numbers yet, and they were kind of just unveiling it. But it's just unfortunate because there's all this buzz generated around these watches all the new ones whether it's brand new watches or just new colors new dial options new complications but they're not available in large numbers yet Mm -hmm. and that can create a very disappointing experience for people who want to see these watches especially watch fans who saw them like two days ago at watches and wonders and they're like hey i'd love to see this watch and i'm like me too Yeah. (laughs) You know, and it's oftentimes they'll get something to us uh, relatively quickly and then it'll sell and then we're waiting and we can maybe special order it for someone, but then they'd have to buy it sight unseen, which is uncommon. It just creates this confusion around what's available. Mm -hmm. When is it available? Yeah. When can I see it? And for us, sometimes we're like, are you sure you're making this watch? Mm -hmm. Because you made this big announcement for it. Where's the watch? I will say that the second I saw the Yacht Master 42 Titanium from Rolex last year, 
at Watches and Wonders. I lost my mind. And I really, really was hoping I would see one in the real. More so, I was hoping I'd be able to put it on my wrist and then call it mine. And that hasn't happened, unfortunately. And not even that, but like I haven't actually seen it in the real. And most people that I speak with are like, well, it's it's made out of like, you know, unicorn dust and, uh, you know, uh, mithril, right? It just, it's unobtainium, but in the sense that no one's seen one. I haven't seen one. So there you go. I've never seen one. So, I mean, and it's, I mean, we're coming up on one year now. Maybe Rolex is a special example on account of the high, high, high demand for all their stuff. But sure. honestly, no, I, I think sometimes maybe the announcements are made almost like a sneak peek, like, Hey, this watch is out. Is it, is it, is it out yeah. or is it out in such small numbers that it's not readily available? I was really impressed to see the Omega boutiques having that white dial Beanmaster. speedmaster, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um, Obviously, that's not a new watch. It's a new dial. But still, they announced it, and it was in boutiques. I don't know if they had 20 of them in the back or just one. Sure, yeah. But even still, that's yep. really cool. Um, I think my issue is that once the announcement is made, the perception is that this is now a live product mm -hmm. sold by authorized dealers. We've made the big announcement. We've made the product. Go and check it out. And it's either not available or available in such tiny, small, infinitesimal numbers. They may as well not be real. Exactly. Or it's like, I can get you this watch if you're willing to buy it. But if you're waiting for one to show up in store, yeah. you might be waiting a while. And even then, it might sell in 24 hours. Right. That right. was the Black Bay 54. That was the maroon bezel with the five-link bracelet, the one we definitely don't call the Jubilee. Those, and remain so, so, so popular, they don't stay in stock very long. So is the takeaway then for watch fans essentially to temper their expectations and just to realize that, hey, if something is announced at Watches and Wonders 2024, just know that there is a chance that you'll be able to see it at your local AD. But more often than not, there needs to be at least a buffer time of, hey, chillax for a little bit. You're not going to you're not going to get your hands on it for a little bit. You know, that's hard to say because different brands are better at it or, or just kind of more expedient to get the product into stores and others. So what they should know is that the first year of this watch's existence after its announcement at Watches and Wonders, it's going to be the least available and the most popular, regardless of what the product is, regardless of what the price is, regardless of the brand. So that should be their expectation is mm. that regardless of why you saw it online, regardless of the announcement, you're looking at it at a very popular time and potentially it was in stores the day after release and now it's gone. Yep. Yeah. Because it was the most popular. It just is a big announcement. This is what happens with things that are cool and, and awesome. People will jump on it and uh, there you go. But definitely uh, there's a, a bunch of us at the store who are like, oh gosh, I don't want to work that weekend. We're going to get so many phone calls. Like, hey, do you have this? I'm like, dude, I just found out about it today. No, I don't have it. I'm I'm just imagining you all just like holding back the dam and just like hold brace for impact. My Excel sheet needs a new <laughs> table. Mm -hmm. So Connor, if you had to summarize it, what would you say? It's a great time for the watch industry. It's an exciting time. It gets people interested. It gets people hyped. It's hard to know when these products are really going to be available after they're launched, but it doesn't take away from the coolness or the excitement of them and. Honestly, even though I am dreading it, I'm also really excited for it. I'd love to go sometime. It looks cool. But I think just watching watch media and consuming it that way will be very interesting. I'm excited to come back and talk about what we're going to learn after these days in April when we find out what is actually coming out. 100%. We have to do a recap of uh, essentially what we said, which most of it, probably none of it will happen because we're silly. We know nothing about the watch industry. Of course. But it'd be cool to do a recap and see just how wrong we were or just how right we were. <laughs> okay. And I'm with you on that. If uh, ever given the opportunity for us to go to Watches and Wonders, I would love to do a power duo of us just on the scene, on the floor, just looking at watches from the floor because we'll be on the floor. Yeah. Us. Yeah flooring it up just flooring it up there was one more thing that we can talk about and that is of course 
rumors like through the grapevine what are what's the buzz what's the, what's the gist physicist yeah i mean i have no official insight strong rumors coming from the fan base kind of centered around two things in regards to rolex one is there's a lot of buzz around the cancellation or discontinuation i should say of the pepsi mm -hmm. dial gmt master 2 mm -hmm. i would be shocked to see that same, uh, same. partially because it's kind of the not kind of it is the original gmt they've discontinued gmt watches in the past again that would really surprise me anything's possible that would really surprise me same amount of rumors or equal buzz around the reissue of the black and red bezel, the one they call a Coke, which I think is a super cool design. I really like that watch. I would honestly be shocked. And again, I have no insight. They could do bloody anything. I would be shocked to see any GMT news from Rolex. Really? Like whether whether it's discontinued or added to the portfolio? Who's to say with the discontinuation? I have no insight right. into that. So yeah. that could be just a thing they say, hey, we're not making this anymore. Again, I'd be surprised, but it could happen. But last year they put out two new ones. That's true. They put the Sprite, yep. which has the black and green bezel, as well as what I like to call the Guinness, which is in you yellow Rolosaur, the black and kind of gray bezel. We're you calling would. it the Guinness. Okay. Two new GMTs. The GMT is an insanely successful watch from Rolex. It's one of the most desired watches they produce. It doesn't need help. Tell me about it. I mean, it needs help in regards to make some more. Yeah. But that does not need a popularity boost. It does not need another color. It does not need another whatever mm. i mean maybe if they do something crazy like produce a you know smaller version or something but i would be again shocked to see that i just there's a lot of buzz around the gmt and i just personally don't think there'll be any gmt news but i'm also prepared to be the wrongest guy in the room which i frequently am uh well unlike you i always get things 100 percent correct so i will go ahead and say the pepsi will not be discontinued mm. i can understand the frustration and the thinking and maybe you know hey this is really difficult to to uh, manufacture there's so many other things that we can manufacture on those lines that potentially are being used by the red and blue i think it's going to stay but i don't know i'm hopeful i'm hopeful that something new i mean there'll be something new there'll be something new but the new GMT, I be I would be shocked. Also, let's be real. This bicolor ceramic bezel is ridiculously hard to make, and Rolex has absurdly high standards for them to launch two new bezels and then the following year launch new bezel colors, even if it is black and red, which I don't think was ever made in ceramic. No. Okay, it was only ever made in aluminum. So yep. basically new. I mean, they make black, they make red. But I'd be really surprised to see any GMT news. I'd love to see something more in the lines of their dress watch. Mm. I don't expect to see that either, but that would be really cool. I would love to see Rolex pivot away some more from sport watches and into more dress watches. I agree. I'll add another rumor that I've sort of heard percolating a little bit, um, and that is the introduction of a titanium Submariner. Oh. You know, they had the Behemoth at 50 mil. They had the Yacht Master, which is sort of like the fancy version of the Submariner. Uh, and then they took something that was more, let's say, upper class, uh, less rough and tumble, and then they made it more rough and tumble by having it have that deep titanium brushing. But the rumor mill is saying that there could be a possibility of potentially seeing a titanium Submariner, which if you think about it is sort of like the, I won't say everyday, but it is like the rough and tumble sort of version of diving watches that Rolex makes now in a more rugged material. I mean, that does make sense as they're making more and more cases and bracelets made entirely of titanium. I could see that trend continuing. That does make sense to me. I can make an argument for the Sea Dweller as well. The Sea Dweller 43 in titanium, just to save some of that weight. Yeah. Uh, it is a beefier case. But either way, I'd be just over the moon just to have any new titanium piece uh, from the crown be announced because I am a big fan. Well, now with Watches and Wonders 2024 topic out of the way, maybe we transition over to the first ever Q&A session dedicated to asking questions of an AD. What do you think? What does Q&A stand for? Q&A, great question. As an acronym for questions and answers. Oh, so you'll read me a question and then you'll read me an answer? I will read you the question that a listener has sent me dedicated or focused solely at the answering by an AD, that's you. Oh. And then you provide the answer. Oh, so you're the question guy and I'm the answer guy? Correct. In this scenario, yes. Ugh. Ding, ding, ding. Lovely. 
<laughs> ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. So first question asked by Big Fat Meow, aka Andrew. He says, Hey AD, how did you get into the watch game? And if someone is looking for a career change, how challenging is it to become an AD? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I got into the game as like a, a second career. Uh, I was a, a teacher before this. The question of how did I get into it? Um, there was a, a new store opening that was specializing in watches and I applied. Part of the allure was the training. And of course, I love the product. I think, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, the products are often watches, right? And you can study them and you can know them and you need to. You, you need to be very knowledgeable about what you're dealing with and the brands you're dealing with and how they like to be spoken of and, and all the different qualifications. And, and that's all well and good. And I think a lot of people, including a lot of watch hobbyists, would be really good at that part of the, of the job. The other part of the job, which is less appetizing for some people and, and less desirable for some people, is at the end of the day, it's a sales job. And while it is awesome to just talk watches and it's so fun to meet people and talk about their collections, that's not always what's going to pay your bills. You, you need to produce numbers. And, and that's the unfortunate reality of being in a sales position is that some months you're on top and you feel great. And then a new month ticks over and you're kind of starting at zero again and you need to crawl your way back up. And so there's quite a bit of stress involved because you need to produce and you need to work really hard and you need to not give up and show up to work every day. Um, so if a sales position and all that entails is appealing to you, then yeah, I do think it's a really fun and interesting job, but it's not one I would recommend to everyone because you really need to show up and give it your all every day. Not that other jobs don't, that's dumb. I just mean, you're really customer facing all day, every day, and you need to put out your best foot forward or you'll struggle. Insightful. Thank you so much. Are you ready for another one? Ready. All right. This one's a little bit spicy. Ooh. This question was sent in by Tempest Obsession on Instagram. And Tempest says, is it true that some ADs sell directly to gray dealers? Is it a common practice or is it just a myth? So I've never experienced that. I, I, I'm sure it does exist. I've definitely seen product online with things like uh, the plastic and the tags still attached. That's a big no-no. You're required to remove those specifically for that reason. Um, truth is, the brands only want their products sold by authorized dealers not just for the sake of controlling the price or controlling who gets the product. It's more just they want to know that the person selling this product has gone through their training, knows how to speak about their product and their brand. It's not just a thing with a price tag, especially in the brand's eyes, right? This is a legacy and this, there's so much more than just it costs X dollars and it's a watch, which would be like an eBay listing kind of thing. It's more than that. So I've never personally come across it, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happened at some point, uh, that especially during the height of the pandemic when people were struggling and the temptation was real, real, real for things that were selling three to four times over their retail price. The reason why I doubt it's as prolific as people believe is because as soon as the brand found out, they're pulling out of your store. So while you might have sold that watch for double what you would have got had you sold it for the retail price, well, now you don't have that brand anymore, which over months and years could be tens, hundreds, millions of dollars you're saying goodbye to. And yeah, could you do it once and get away with it? Sure, maybe, probably. But the risk, oh my gosh, I mean, you could literally end your business and it happens. It's not an idle threat. It happens. So to me, it just seems like, why would you ever take that risk? Yeah. You know, it's it's like uh, doing something illegal yep. where it's like, hey, you made some quick cash, but now you could like pay a serious, you know, consequence as a result of your actions. So for that reason, it's very hard for me to believe. I've heard about it happening when places are really small and they're going out of business mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they don't care anymore. 
Yeah. What are you going to do? Pull my brand? I'm closing the store. Yeah. 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 You know what I mean? Like that. But often brands will buy back product and there's usually, you know, other places to sell it to and you have other options. So I don't believe it happens as much as people believe it does, is my honest opinion. But I've never actually encountered it. So I don't really have any true insight. Well, I mean, still great way to look at it and great insight to share in that. You know, it's a very real and very high risk, low reward, honestly, given that it is so frowned upon. It is so such a big no, no. Are you ready for a third question? Mm -hmm. Let's go. Next question was sent in by Watch You Wearing. And they say, AD, what are your true feelings about the waitlist? And does it dishearten you that you don't have the watches readily available to sell? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, it's it's not fun. It's not fun to disappoint people. I've talked about client relationships before on this podcast and how important it is and how challenging it is to uh, simply just make people happy and get them what they want. You know, I, 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 I never sold Rolex before the wait list, so I don't really have that experience of what it used to be like. I've only ever sold it post pandemic where it's it's this. So I don't have a full context on the situation, but it's a lot of work and it's not fun <laughs> and i'm trying to think of a thing i like about it no it sucks <laughs> it sucks it's it's not fun for anybody and it's like sometimes people are like well, you know it sucks you have this list and i can't just buy a watch and it's like dude i work in sales if i could sell you a product right now i would 100 percent sell you this product like yeah. why would i choose zero dollars over some dollars yeah. i would never make that choice so I would much rather just be able to distribute product to people who get what they want. At the same time, these are special items. These aren't regular household daily things you would find in a Target or a whatever. So maybe that's just kind of the consequence of this type of product in this type of industry. Super fair. And yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you want to make more people happy, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Are you ready for a fourth question? Oh gosh, there's a fourth question. There is a fourth question. Okay, let's go. All right, here we go. This one is sent in by Barbells and Watches on Instagram. And they say... That guy's a cool Instagram. He really does. He really does. He's, he's a really cool dude as well. I like him a lot. The question is, do ADs have extra stock in the back and do they hold it back for any reason? Uh, okay, I'm assuming this is made about Rolex. Yeah. Um, it's, it's safe to assume it's, it's tied to the hot pieces. Sure, sure, sure. The hot pieces, because they're hot, they have extra care into who they get distributed to so is there a situation where you walk into a rolex authorized dealer and say hey i'd like to buy you know that panda daytona in steel and they say well you know no <laughs> for whatever you know whatever they say but it's no yeah yeah th there is a chance that they they actually do have one but it isn't that they have one and you can't have it it's that it's for someone else Right. You know, like yeah. it is, it's earmarked for someone else because they're most likely if you're walking in today saying, Hey, I want this watch. Well, yeah, we met this other guy 18 months ago Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they've been waiting patiently and they've been a really good client. And so, yeah, does that situation exist? Potentially it could, but you got to understand like these rare, rare pieces, they're rare. They're ra They really are rare. Certainly, I, I know people believe that, you know, oh, you got a, a safe in the back with 300 watches and you just don't want to sell it to me. Dude, it's not personal. I would so sell you this watch because why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I want to make this money? But these watches are sold for the retail price, not a penny more. I sell it to that guy as much as I'd sell it to you. So the dollar amount doesn't change. I'm not in it for that. I'm not holding out. Your money is the exact same as his. Doesn't make a difference. What makes a difference is that we're working on client relations here. And in order to make our potentially long-term clients happy, you who we just met today might leave unhappy. Um, and that is the reality of the situation. But it certainly isn't that I'm holding it back from you, mm -hmm. but I'm totally gonna sell it to the next guy who walks in because I don't know, for whatever reason that I would do that. But yeah, like if, if, if something is in theory could be yours and it's not going to be yours today there's a reason behind it and it's not a personal one it just has to do with the personal other person or other several people who are involved i got you and actually this ties in nicely because barbells and watches sent in two questions have you met him is he really buff in real life uh he does work out and i assume he's pretty buff 
more buff than me for sure but that's not saying much no comment okay thank you uh the second question was how do you jump the 80 rolex list without spending a million pounds ah, because he's he's from he's from the, the other UK. side of the pond yeah. Yeah, yeah so his weights are in kilograms anyways i'm not gonna know him <laughs> um how do you jump the line you know it's relations it's relationships um and those relationships are defined by that you have this relationship <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's it. That's that's really it. Um, those relationships are managed a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, sometimes it is like, okay, cool, we've done business together. I realize you're not a reseller, uh, but there's no magic formula to skip to the top, including spending money. I think oftentimes the conclusion that people reach is that I'm not getting X because I'm not spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the guy over there who is getting it is. You can spend a lot of money and still still not get what you want. It's not which is Which magic. is what we talked about in yeah. episode two, right? With that horrible, horrible scenario that you put me in. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. You brought that up because mm. when you talked about that scenario mm -hmm. and I listened back to it, mm -hmm. you justified not giving it to the person who I talked about had this was a loyal client who's yeah. done business because you were like, well, this guy already has 12 Rolexes. I said 30. Whatever. I never said that. That yeah. was, you know what I mean? Like you justified it out because you're like, well, that guy's a millionaire. No, no, no. These aren't <laughs> the watches aren't going to millionaires with 30 watches. They're going to someone just like you. It's just they've been working on this relationship longer, which is a great sort of like connecting tissue there. Right. It's not having to spend a million pounds necessarily. No. That being said, rainbow Daytonas, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Peace uniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is layers to this thing. But, you know, those are like two hundred thousand dollar watches anyways. Yeah. So it, it's not like why would they be on the sales floor? I mean, you could right you know now say, I mean? you could say, would you like a rainbow Daytona? I'd be like, I would love one. He's like, well, today's your lucky day. Cause yeah, it's right. I'd be like, I $225,000 retail I, last I looked, something like that. It wouldn't Maybe matter. More. Cause I don't have that kind of money. Right. Like, <laughs> so yeah, there's well put, there's layers to it. And, um, that's something that we don't think about necessarily. Yeah. And like, you know, like other, whether it's cars or it's watches or it's kind of things like this, there's, reasons why certain products are not as accessible is because the allure is the rarity mm. not intended to be like a regular submariner isn't intended to be that but like you know the the off catalog pieces or you know all this kind of stuff like yeah that's that's not meant to be seen on every wrist when you go to the mall because if it was then it doesn't become the special thing yeah, yeah. right rainbow daytonas they should be a big deal because it's like Super Bowl winning quarterbacks who wear them. Yeah. And, you know, the Max Verstappens of the world, if he wasn't an LVMH guy. You know what I mean? Like, that's who has those because that's kind of what they're intended to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those aren't meant to be regular pieces. Yeah. My advice is you pick an authorized dealer and that's your person. And you stick with them and you form that relationship. I mean, whether it's you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, that's hopefully you find one you really like hopefully you find one that you can connect with and it's not a chore for you and I, you can show up and just talk watches totally. not necessarily buying anything yeah but sometimes maybe buying something i mean that helps but but it's not everything but it's not everything and it's, it's also it's like you know hanging out hey how was your weekend all right cool just checking in talk to you later yeah whatever you know because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it shows you're still interested it shows you still care it shows you're still wanting to be a part of this process even though it's not awesome for you. And they know that. We know that. But we're slogging through it just like you. Well put. Well put. Well, that's all the questions that I have for you right now that are AD specific. And I think that brings us to the end of episode three. What do you think? Can't believe we made it through three episodes. We did it. Congratulations. Yeah. Well done. I will get you some flowers for episode four. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I was hoping you could just make this room even hotter for next episode. Well, here's the thing. All the windows have to be closed, okay? Because then outside noises come in and it's just a pain in the butt to edit out. So, so you're saying there's potential. There's potential. There's definitely potential. Always. Maybe I should stop showing up in a suit. Mm, maybe. But you're just such a professional guy. It's who you are. It's true. So speaking of the next episode, maybe we come back uh, for episode four and we talk about, you know, what actually went down during Watches and Wonders 2024 and see just how right or more likely how wrong we were about mm, basically everything we said. I'd love to be wrong about all the rumor stuff. Yeah. There's no way they'll do this. And then they do all those things uh -huh. like just to just to completely invalidate any like 
insight we had. But but let's 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 keep it real. If Rolex unveils, they'll never make a titanium watch again, and they hate the material. In fact, <laughs> everyone says that. I would cry. But let's keep it real. If we were to backtrack and rewind a year from today, before the 2023 watches and wonders, and I would say, or anyone for that matter would say. I predict or I believe that Rolex is going to introduce a day date with emojis and these crazy <laughs> colors and then an Oyster Perpetual with all the little bubble color dials in one. Would we believe them? No, of course not. Of course not. People don't believe it's real now and it is real. That would be so off the wall or for Rolex. We, Espresso Hublot collab. Or a, there you go. Like, you know, it's just not really in the realm of feasibility, but... It happens, so... Which is exciting. It's I exciting. love that we don't know. Yeah. If this was easy to predict, if this was... If this was, hey, do you think they'll announce another Call of Duty this year? <laughs> do you think they'll make Madden 2024? Do you think they'll do FIFA this year? Whoa, they unveiled it. Crazy. I also, it has all the football players. Yeah. Crazy. It's strange. I also think that there's going to be a new F1 title. <laughs> Maybe. We'll what do see. you think's going to be on the cover? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Sergio Perez, I think. Yeah, Maybe, probably him. Probably. Uh, or Lewis Hamilton. Who knows? Definitely not that for stopping guy. Yeah, no, why would they put him on the front? Connor, do me a favor. Yeah. Please tell the people how they can get a hold of you on the socials if they wanted to. Yeah, yeah. You can find me at Watches and Blunders on Instagram. Put those underscores between those words, Watches and Blunders. And on that note, it's time to conclude episode three of the Timeless podcast series. A sincere thank you for hanging out with us. Hopefully you enjoyed yourself and had some fun along the way. If you did, then please push all the buttons that will help you hear more of us in the future. And of course, a special thank you to my co-host, Connor. If you want to connect with Connor and talk more watches, then I recommend you follow him on Instagram. And speaking of socials, if you want to continue the conversation, you can find me at the underscore timist underscore IG on Instagram. Thanks for listening. I'm the timist. Be well, and I'll catch you in the next one.